All right, so what types of chemical reactions have we covered so far? Or what are the major types of chemical reactions? Acid base, oxidation reduction, and one more. Well, one more is a uh, starts with an M. from writing on it and then uh, return it at the end. Good. That would be great. Well, anyway, regardless, I'm going to then obviously let to review this stuff, but you should be reviewing as well because we don't have enough time to review the entire course. Because that's commonly the case, a lot of people ask for the uh, abbreviated version of the course. That is, tell me exactly what's going to be on the final, but you know, you're going to be hard pressed to find an instructor that's going to tell you exactly what's going to be on the final. They'll usually just tell you the entire course is going to be on the final, and therefore um, turns out to be a lot of material. <laughs> and so, anyway, um, we're going to review the, the, uh, the chemical reaction. I'll post these slides on on um, Piazza. But we want to think about the chemistry. You know, we want to think about the uh, the reactions, you know, composition, structure, and property. The property is going to be two types of properties: the physical properties and the chemical properties. We talked about this near the beginning. In fact, you guys remember this? We talked about this. At First week in class. Here they're they're calling the physical properties the properties and the chemical properties the reactions, but it's just called chemical properties. So we'll go into chemical properties. So I might ask you something like, uh, what are the chemical properties of a particular substance? And so you think about this, you know, then you think, okay, what or how to approach it problem like that. If we were to ask you what are the chemical properties of HCl, how would you approach that? It's an acid. It's an acid. That's good. What else? So yeah, yeah uh, HCl is hydrochloric acid, so uh, it's an acid. But is there anything else? Or not. If there's something else, what do we look for? We look for. Well, we look for, yeah, from, based on the composition, we're going to look for certain types of reactions. What types of reactions are we going to look for? Acid base. Acid base. Well, HCl is an acid. We look for. Soluble and insoluble is in relation to what type of reaction? Soluble and insoluble is a driving force for what type of reaction? Not acid base. That's the one we look for in the acid base, stronger acid and weaker acid, but when we look for solubility and insolubility for what type of reaction?
you probably remember, you just don't remember the name, but you know, I, I always think about this too. Sometimes I read a book and I spend weeks reading this book and then months later I completely forget it and go, was it even worth spending weeks reading that book if in a couple of months I forget it? Well, I started reading this book um, and I finished it and, uh, sorry, and the book, actually my memory is getting worse because I just finished it like last week and I was thinking, you know, how much of that book do I remember, you know? And I spent a lot of time reading that book and I thought, was it really worth it? And how to make it worth it, you know? You spend, how much time do you spend in this class? Just only to forget it. I know somebody, um, did I tell you about my friend who was studying for the MCAT? He spent, um, I think he spent like five years at UCLA. He started there as a freshman, but he forgot everything. So he spent another, another, I don't know how many years because I lost track, but um, he's pretty much after he graduated, he spent many more years uh, relearning everything so he could um, so he could do well on the MCAT. You know, the first time he took it, he didn't remember anything. You know, the thing about that, and so the way to remember it is just to refresh your memory once in a while, uh, to think about things, you know, otherwise it's easy to slip away. And so, in that, in that sense, this is, we're reviewing this right now, you know, um, we want to look at the properties of this. This is stuff we talked about during the first three, composition, structure, property, goal. Now, we use a... Um, you know, theoretical plus a descriptive uh, approach to this. You know, what we're learning right now is this. You know, when you learn something new, you just, you don't worry about, you know, getting too caught up. Oh, I don't understand this, or this doesn't make sense. What you do initially is you just kind of memorize things. And the more things you memorize, then the more patterns that you see. And the more patterns that you can see, the more you can relate it to theoretical knowledge. And the more theory you can do, the less you have to memorize. But initially, there's a lot of work in memorization. This is what makes organic chemistry hard initially. Organic chemistry is very hard initially because initially, you have to do a lot of memorization. And there are people who resist doing memorization. And so that's why so many people fail out of organic chemistry is, uh, is you have to reach this certain tipping point. And so you have to memorize, 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 and then once you reach a certain tipping point, then you can do much more theoretically. Once you can do much more theoretically, the, the memorization load goes way down because you can kind of predict what's going to happen. You know? But initially, you're memorizing, you're memorizing what we call mechanisms, you know, how these reactions occur. It's a tremendous amount of work. But a lot of people, they never make it to that tipping point, you know, where all of a sudden things kind of click. They're just in this zone where they're struggling. Well, um, that's uh, that's why, you know, initially a lot of descriptive work, like is HCl a gas, liquid, or solid at room temperature? What is it? It's a gas. How do you know? Well, you memorize it. Is that a physical property or a chemical property? That's a physical property. Now, what are the chemical properties of HCl? Well, it's an acid, but is that all? No, that's not all. You know, there are other chemical properties of HCl. So what types of things will HCl react with? So those are the types of things we need to think about here in this particular section. Well, properties are very important. Um, they're often used to ID things. So I'm going to skip this. Physical properties are, are typical. Physical properties are a mismatch of different things like boiling point. What else? Solid, liquid, gas. It's called the state. What else? Can you think of? Well, you know, I think about physical properties, color. Form, you know, what kind of crystals is very crystalline, is powdered, state, gas, 
liquid. Boiling point, melting point, the physical properties. Can you think of any others? Mass is a property, yeah. How much you have, the physical characteristic. We have, um, when we talk about physical characteristics, there's two types of physical properties. There's extensive properties and intensive properties. Extensive mass would be an example of an extensive property. You know, a kilogram of gold is different than a gram of gold. That's an extensive property. Extensive properties depend on the amount. Intensive properties don't. You know, does a kilogram of gold melt at a different temperature than a gram of gold, or do they melt at the same temperature? They melt at the same temperature. That's an intensive property. And so we have a mix of intensive properties and extensive properties that we call physical properties here. Another intensive property would be boiling point. Another intensive property would be freezing point, density, etc. And so, you know, when we think about um, when we think about physical properties, we typically don't have a systematic approach to those. And the same thing with chemical properties. When we think about chemical properties, a lot of people don't have a systematic approach to those. For physical properties, well, physical properties of things vary. So, you know, there's certain standard physical properties, and then there are others like electrical conductivity. Electrical conductivity is not applicable to well, it is applicable, I guess, to everything because we have things that are called insulators, which don't conduct electricity. We have semiconductors, which kind of conduct electricity. And then we have uh, electrical conductors, which uh, conduct electricity quite well. But there's, there's not really, and maybe we should have a systematic approach to this. You know, there's just a mishmash. Well, the same thing with chemical properties. Like, if I think about HCl, what should I do? Should I take a... a a sample of HCl and then just try to react that with as many different chemicals as I can. No. So um, think of some other chemical properties of HCl. What are some other chemical properties of HCl? I just take care of this one thing. Do you remember what we did with the acid-base chart? Basically, we figured this out here. We figured out that HCl, in order to go from stronger to weaker acid, it has to react in this way. HCl loses the proton to form chloride. Well, we want it to react this way, where uh, HSO4 minus gains that proton to form H2SO4, so we're we'll going from stronger acid to weaker acid. Do you remember doing this last week? Well, that's the case. Well, what if HCl loses the proton to bromide? Then if HCl loses the proton to bromide, it forms HBr, which should be a stronger acid. So that in this case, there's going to be no driving force. So HCl should react with all bases that are stronger than chloride here. But there's something called the leveling effect. Can you remind me what the leveling effect is? It's when water is leveling effect is that all, what do we say, all strong acids have the, same strength in the water. So HCl is going to react with all these bases here on the right side of this chart, all of them, except these. These bases are just too weak to react in water. So
So, is that it for HCl? No, that's not it because that's only acid-base reactions. What other types of reactions are there? Metathesis. HCl reacts with the chloride in HCl reacts with silver ions to form precipitate of silver chloride, lead ions, and mercury. So if we took like silver nitrate in HCl, it's going to form a precipitate, or you know, um, or lead. 2 nitrate will form precipitate, or lead 2 acetate, or nitrate will form precipitate. And so HCl does that as well. And so we have um, metathesis and redox. Well, this is your typical list. This is a typical list that's found in books, combination, decomposition, acid base, single replacement, double replacement, combustion, precipitation, neutralization, etc. It's a typical list. That's the one that's kind of found in our book. But uh, it's not comprehensive, you know. So for example, if you're given this problem, HCl plus nitric acid plus coal, how would you predict that? Does it fit one of those patterns that you've seen? No, it doesn't. So it's not, not a comprehensive list. We, we, want, we need something more comprehensive. And also it's confusing. So for example, this is a combination. Carbon plus oxygen yields CO2. This is also a combination. Calcium oxide plus CO2 yields calcium carbonate. These are two totally different reactions. Even though both of these are combination, one is a redox, the other is an acid base. They have different driving forces. I mean, you, you can't group them together. It doesn't really uh, work that way. And so this is why the three types, which are, we already talked about, metathesis, acid base, redox. All right, we already talked about metathesis. We, we talked about acid base. Now I want to talk about redox. Redox. All right, this presentation is going to be a little different than what your book does. Here. Okay, can you just uh, refresh your memory on single replacement, combustion, and uh, combination? We've done one, two, three. 
these are covered. These are covered in the book. However, the, this this fourth method is not covered in the book. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, number six skeleton redox is covered in the book. This will be at the end. And so what we're going to do at number five is beyond the scope. Number five, we're going to skip this. All right, so um, what we're going to talk about here is this. It's going to be uh, called the chart method here. And, um, it, it's going to offer you a more powerful um, way of, of determining the products and driving force for redox reaction. So let's go through that really quick here. Uh, the redox chart method is uh, we follow these steps here. This is similar to acid base. We inventory the major species in solution. And then we look for the strongest oxidizer present. So what we have to do is we have to label each species, whether it's an oxidizer, reducer, or neither. The way we do that is we use this chart here. This is a chart on your handout. If you look on the left, we have F2. You have to memorize this. F2 is the strongest oxidizer on the chart. And then at the bottom left, right, is Li solid. Li solid is the strongest reducer on the chart. Now these numbers here will help us determine the driving force quantitatively. So these are called um, potentials, or half. these are half potentials. And um, these ones were, were removed out of here, but you can base it on the number like for example water, water is minus 0.828. So minus 0.828 puts water right here between Cn2 plus and aluminum 3 plus. So water would fit right in there. All right, so we're gonna use this chart. So the first thing you do is you just read down the, the species in the chart to try to get familiar. You know, what you see something that the strong oxidizers have in common, or maybe there are multiple patterns there. You see something the strong reducers have in common. Well, automatically I see something that all strong reducers have in common. What is that? They are all... No. I mean, yes, but they're solids on the left, too. They are all, like PDO2 is a solid, and it's a strong oxidizer. There's something else they all share in common. What is it? They're all metals. Metals are electron-rich, what we call. The oxidizer is electron poor. So we use the chart to find the strongest oxidizer present and the strongest reducer present. Okay, step four. We combine the strongest oxidizing agent or oxidizer half reaction with the strongest reducer, reducing agent half reaction. So what we do is we'll just copy them off the chart, making sure that the number of electrons consumed is equal to the number of electrons lost by changing coefficients if necessary. Okay, then we simplify, and then uh, we look for a driving force, stronger to weaker. Uh, this method will yield the NIE. So let's just do an example of this. Fortunately, I have to, to go. So the first example we're going to look at is copper plus nitric acid, Cu plus HNO3. Uh, if we do this as single replacement, this looks like a single replacement, so this is going to give us copper 2 nitrate plus hydrogen gas. If we do this as a single replacement, it turns out that we're going from um, less active to more active. If we're going from less active to more active, then there's no driving force. No driving force. Therefore, no reaction. But, but this is wrong. There is a reaction here. Single replacement just doesn't tell us what that reaction is. And so in this particular case, we have to use the um, chart method. 
Okay, so first is the inventory the solution. So when we inventory the solution, what do I have? I have copper solid, I have H plus present, I have nitrate present, and I have water present. This is the aqueous solution of nitric acid. And so I inventory it. And then I look at the chart. I'm going to look at the chart and look for all these species. So um, first off, I'll look for copper. And then I see copper is on the right here. And it's in the middle. So what we call it is a moderate reducer, a moderate weak reducer. So any, anyway, it's going to be a reducing agent. RA stands for reducing agent. I look for copper on the left. But this copper on the left is different from this copper on the right. Do you see it? This copper on the left is copper ion. This is copper metal. Is copper metal the same as copper ion? No. OK, then I look for a H plus. Well, H plus only occurs on the left, and it's kind of in the middle. So we call it moderate oxidizer. So um, we'll just call it OA for oxidizing agent. And then I look for nitrate. I see nitrate. Do you see nitrate? Up here. Nitrate's getting, this is stronger. But I need H plus. Nitrate plus four H pluses. So there has to be some extra H pluses around for nitrate to work like this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bar here indicating that nitrate, when combined with H plus, is an oxidizer. And then I have to have some familiarity with this chart. Now I look for water. Water is down here. At the bottom left. Water is at the bottom left, but it doesn't belong at the bottom left. We look at the number over here, minus 0.828. Minus 0.828 places it right here between Zn2 plus and Al3 plus. Do you see that? And so water is kind of a weak oxidizer. Do you see that? Weak oxidizer, but we're just going to call it an oxidizing agent. Now, you have to have some familiarity with this chart because water can go either way. Um, here's water up here. Do you see it? But what are we missing? Oxygen. So skip that. Here we have water here. Do you see that? That's water alone. Water alone is a very weak reducing agent. You know, the strongest is lithium down here. But when you're familiar with this chart, you'll see this. Do you see this water here? You see the water occurs twice, up here and down here. What's the difference? The difference is the product. This one forms hydrogen peroxide. This water, if we go backwards, forms oxygen. Well, oxygen is more stable than hydrogen peroxide. So this one turns out to be the stronger reducing agent compared to this one. You know, the stronger one is as we go down. So water is stronger. And so water can go either way. It can be an oxidizing agent or it can be a reducing agent. Here. OK, now what the next step is we pick the strongest. So how many oxidizing agents do we have? We have one, two, three. OK, what is the absolute strongest oxidizer? The absolute strongest oxidizer is F2 on the chart. They're, they're actually stronger ones. And then let's work our way down. What's the first one we encounter? The first one we encounter is nitrate. Do you see that? Nitrate with 4H plus. And so this, this one turns out to be the strongest oxidizing agent. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to copy down that equation. So we copy down that equation. It says nitrate plus 4H plus plus how many electrons? Three electrons yields NO gas plus 2H2O liquid. Then we look for the strongest reducing agent. What's the strongest reducing agent? Copper or water? So let's go down the chart and look for the strongest reducing agent, which is lithium. And so we're going to work our way until we hit the first one, copper or water. And so which one do we hit first? Well, here's water. But there's something missing. What's missing? Sulfate. Uh, not sulfate. Sulfur dioxide gas, we don't have that. Here's copper. So copper, 
Water is way up here. Do you see that? Water alone. And so copper is stronger. And so here, what we have to do is we have to reverse it because now we don't want copper as a product. We want copper as a reactant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation and flip it. I have to flip this one because copper is a reactant. Reactants occur on the left side, so copper solid goes to copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons. And so that's our strongest oxidizer here. This is our strongest reducer. Now, here's where the conjugate relationship might help you. The conjugate relationship is going to say this. If our oxidizer is here, this must be our conjugate reducing agent here. That is, if we go backwards, this one loses electrons. Oxidizers take electrons. If this is our reducing agent, then this is, must be our conjugate oxidizing agent because going backwards, this copper 2 would take electrons. But these are our reactants here, and those belong on the left. And so the next step is we need to add these up, making sure the electrons cancel. Well, if I have three electrons here being gained, I need something to produce three electrons, but this only produces two. So it's a mismatch. But I can fix this mismatch by multiplying the whole thing by some factor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this entire equation here and multiply it by two. If I multiply by two, that gives me six electrons here. And then I'm going to take this entire equation here and multiply it by 3. Electrons must match. Must match. That's why I'm multiplying it here. Electrons must match. But so what I'm going to have here is this. I'm going to have um, 3 nitro, oh no, two nitrates, sorry. I'm going to have two nitrates plus 8H plus plus six electrons. Okay, that's all the reactants there on the top equation. I'm going to add that to the reactants on the bottom equation. The reactants on the bottom equation would be plus three Cu solid. Okay, then I'm going to add all the react, um, products here. And so just adding up all the products, just do it over here. I'm going to get 2NO gas plus 4H2O liquid plus 3Cu2 plus plus 6 electrons. This must happen. If this gains 6 electrons, then we must lose 6 electrons somewhere. The electrons have to balance. We can't bottle up these electrons and um, use them later. That's it. And so that's the simplification part. OK, what's next? And the next step is um, we simplify, and then we've got to look uh, for driving force. Now, the driving force is going to be like this. The nitrate and H plus, this is our oxidizing agent. The copper is our reducing agent. Going backwards, NO and water, this is our reducing agent. And Cu2 plus is our oxidizing agent. What we're going to do is we're going to compare the two oxidizing agents. Nitrate and H plus and copper 2 plus. Which one's stronger? Nitrate and H plus or copper 2 plus? So if I go over here and take a look. Which one's stronger? Nitrate and H plus versus copper 2 plus. Which one's stronger? The nitrate and H plus is stronger than the copper 2 plus. That means the reducing agents must follow. Copper must be a stronger reducing agent than NO and water. Copper is a stronger reducing agent than NO and water. Have that. Copper is closer to lithium down here. And so there's driving force present. And so single replacement predicted no reaction, no redox reaction, but indeed there was a redox reaction. The chart method worked. The only drawback with the chart method is it takes more time than single replacement. But you don't have to worry about missing exceptions. Single replacement fails in a number of instances. And so we can use the chart method as an alternative to single replacement. All right. 
So what we're going to do, I, unfortunately, I have to cut out early because uh, something came up. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the quiz, and you, you can work on it in class. It's going to be kind of longer. So I'll just turn it in, and then we'll call it a day. But this is it. Um, this quiz is going to be part review as well. Sorry, hydroidic acid. 
the month. Oh, and I need to do one more here. G. G is going to be um, silver nitrate. together and uh, you could use whatever you want. If I'm not back in, in by the time you finish this I will call it a day. Okay any questions? Sorry I have to take care of those kind of emergencies. 